All right, hello and happy Friday, everybody. Can uh, everyone hear me on our virtual audience? I'm gonna double check. Excellent. Well, welcome everybody. I am Paige Walters, Director of Development and Talent Initiative, uh, sorry, Director of Development and Business Partnerships here at the Springfield Area Chamber of Commerce. And today I'm thrilled to welcome you all to our third installment of the 2022 Lunchbox Series. These programs allow our business leaders a platform to understand and discuss big picture issues facing our community today and into the future. Uh, already this year, we've talked about the new world of work and next-gen professionals, as well as the future of workforce training and education through the lens of the 2021 Oregon Talent Assessment. And today, we get to dive into the world of evolving cities, gaining an insight into how cities are continuing to evolve under environmental, technological, and social trends. Our gratitude goes out uh, to those organizations supporting this program. Thank you to System West Engineers for sponsoring the lunch today. And a, a very large thank you to US Bank for sponsoring the 2022 Lunchbox Series. At this time, I want to invite uh, Randy Ricci up, um, the wealth management banker from US Bank, just to say a few words. Please join me in giving him a warm welcome. <laughs> I apologize, I don't really have anything planned because I just been shooting for region access to our uh, region president. I'm actually, uh, I did recently move into business banking back in May, so I'm no longer with our wealth management group. Uh, but I just want to say on behalf of the bank, we're really excited uh, to be able to participate and partner with the chamber for these uh, this series. It's been tremendous. Really looking forward to today because we're talking about this a lot within the bank and about evolving uh, cities. And this is something that affects all of us, right? Uh, we have a saying we use, uh, probably overuse, that the uh, pace of change has never been as fast and it will never be as slow again. So I think it really rings true to today and I'm looking forward to the March program and just thank you all for being here. Thank you, Randy. And uh, thank you again to US Bank for sponsoring the series this year. Uh, <clears throat> the program today is being recorded. Uh, we are going to be able to send the recording out to all of you who've registered for the program and we'll make it available on our Small Business Solutions Hub um, online. Uh, so you can look for that next week to go up. Uh, today, we are truly hosting a hybrid program. We're joined both by an in-person and virtual audience. Our main presenter, who you'll be introduced to in just a moment, is also joining us virtually. For our virtual guests, you're welcome to raise your hand or post questions in the chat when you have them. Please consider Danny Thompson, your virtual host over here. Uh, let her know if there's any technical issues you're experiencing. Uh, we need to adjust audio settings or anything. Uh, at this time, it's my pleasure to introduce our facilitator of today's Lunchbox, who's going to introduce our presenter and facilitate the Q&A portion of today's program. So we're thrilled to be joined by Rick Satry, president of the Satry Group. With over 40 years in the industry, Rick has substantial experience with a wide variety of planning, landscape architecture, and environmental projects. Rick brings to a project both the perspective of a local government administrator as well as that of a consultant to local governments and state agencies. He has assisted with metro area planning processes, drafted development code updates, successfully applied for and received facility development grants, facilitated the acquisition of many public properties, and has been the project manager responsible for the development of a number of educational, recreational, commercial, industrial, and residential facilities. I myself have had the pleasure of hearing Rick present to our civic leadership cohort over the past five years during Land Use and Transportation Day and can attest to his expertise in being able to break down very complex issues around land use and development. Uh, so Rick, thank you for joining us today as we explore the topic of evolving cities. Uh, please join me in giving Rick a warm welcome. Thank you, Paige. Thank you for the invitation to participate today. I really appreciate it. You know, we were joking a little bit ago, and it's no joke that Oregon land use law is a full employment act for some of us. It's a double-edged sword. Um, we can talk more about that some other day. But uh, what I would like to do right now is uh, introduce our presenter today. Uh, Mark Mixis is a good friend and a colleague, and, and I, as much as you, I'm looking forward to hearing what Mark has to share with us today. Mark has more than 20 years' experience in delivering high-quality, high-efficiency developments Developments that respond appropriately to the needs of their users and the goals of their owners. Mark combines superior process-driven management, design, communication skills, and a depth of experience in all aspects of real estate development, 
including project sourcing, feasibility, financing, planning, construction, leasing, and property operations. This unique blend of skills and experience has produced outstanding results in all aspects of its clients' development and their development projects. Please join me in welcoming Mark. Okay, thank you, Rick. Everybody can hear me okay? Um, well, thank you, uh, Rick and US Bank for uh, sponsoring this event and certainly for the Springfield Chamber for hosting um, this very interesting series you have. I'm sorry I'm not in person. I um, was surprised by my wife and had planned to be at the coast. Um, so we had scheduled this as a remote meeting and then she came down with COVID. So um, I have an abundance of caution. I'm not going to join a big group of people there. So I actually sit in my office here in Eugene. I wish I could be in that wonderful building and, and do this presentation with you, but uh, we'll just be doing it remote today. Um, I, I think it's a fitting that I'm I'm chatting with um, with business leaders in, in Springfield with our current involvement in Glenwood. That's sort of one of our future projects, something we're very excited about. And um, I think this will be an opportunity for me to talk a little bit about our work and our background, uh, my history, and uh, hopefully we can get into a bit of a discussion at the end of this presentation and talk about um, maybe some opportunities we see in Springfield and, and why we're interested in Glenwood. Um, I'll, I'll give you a quick intro into my background and, and our company background, um, talk about some of our joint venture partners and, and work that we've been doing, and then I'll, I'll go through a, a handful of projects. Um, there's quite a few projects I have on the presentation. Um, I'll touch on kind of some key aspects of each of them, I'll probably not dive in too deep. Uh, if there are specific questions and things we want to cover, we can we can jump back to slides and, and I'm happy to talk about any projects. Um, you know, about me, I'm, I'm a native Eugenian, grew up in the valley, and so um, certainly keenly interested in, in how our city, both, and I, and I look at Spring, Eugene and Springfield really as one, one community, one city, how we've evolved over time. And um, since, since I've grown up, it, it's certainly been a, a big evolution. I think there's been a lot of changes in Eugene and, and Springfield that have been very positive. And um, so excited to, to be here and have come from Eugene. Um, I was a U of O graduate, my degree was in architecture. And so that's the discipline I studied at, at U of O. And uh, after graduating, traveled a bit and then ended up in the Bay Area and worked on with an architecture firm there on large projects uh, throughout the UC system. So big institutional academic projects. And that's really where I got my interest in, I think, projects in general and working on large projects and seeing how they can impact uh, universities and communities. Um, I, I left the Bay Area and, and this, this will tie into some of my, my um, presentation later due to the fact that I, I just couldn't afford it if my lifestyle was being compromised and was um, getting married and planning to have a family. And uh, we actually searched around a bit and ended up uh, coming back to Eugene uh, due to quality of life and the ability to get places easily and have access to the outdoors without spending three and a half hours in the car. Uh, cost of living was a big issue for us and Eugene was uh, relatively affordable compared to living in the Bay Area. Uh, upon landing in Eugene, uh, ended up getting hired by Arlie and Company and worked with them for uh, about five years. And really my main focus there was Crescent Village. I think most of you are probably familiar with that project on the north end of town by Costco. Um, and that was a great opportunity for me to transition from my background in architecture to um, real estate development. And that's where I am today. That's the thrust of my work today. Um, 2008 rolled around and uh, the economy was a little bit difficult. Uh, I'm sure you've all Kind of heard Arlene and Company no longer exists today, and I found myself in 2010 uh, without a job and uh, really kind of hit the street, trying to figure out what I was going to do next, and ended up connecting with uh, my current business partner, Dean Pape, and uh, he was, at, at this time in our work, we were really, he was really running projects for other people. We were, we ended up representing property owners and acted as owner's representatives on managing complex projects from 
uh, either securing sites or entitlements, uh, building a team, hiring architects, contractors, um, and uh, really managing budgets and running projects. That was really the beginning of our company. Um, most of those projects were fairly community-minded uh, projects. We worked with, um, you know, actually what I'm seeing Eugene is a project now that's finally getting built, but that project goes all the way back to 2014. That was one of our early projects we worked on. Uh, worked with Serenity Lane and helped them build out their campus. Um, Northwest Community Credit Union was a project we did in, in Eugene. Um, our, our work really did evolve uh, at that point. Um, let's see, let me jump ahead here. Um, migrating away from doing projects for other people into doing our own work and becoming a sponsor. And that happened, I think, over the last five years, we've really pivoted towards being really more of a, a real estate developer that sponsors projects, raises equity, uh, executes, um, in some cases, as an owner of those projects. Um, and as we started to do that work, we recognized we needed to really focus on sort of what's our current, uh, what are the current values in our company? What are we trying to do? How does that impact both the people we hire and bring on board, the people we partner with, and um, what type of projects were we wanting to pursue? And we really focused, and we've always focused on the people around projects, and both within our company and with our partners. Um, you know, I think that's really what how projects get built is with people and and having tight relationships, building strong teams was really key to that. Um, we also were looking for people that were very passionate about what they did. And so we've grown from a company of two people to, um, I think if you count our affiliated companies, we're at about 19 people now, um, really looking for people who were very interested in what we were trying to do, had passion around that work. Um, with our projects, we wanted to make sure we had positive environmental impact on our projects. I'll talk a little bit about that with some of our projects. Um, I won't focus the, the presentation uh, solely on that, but uh, we did want to make sure we were sort of putting our best foot forward and doing things that that made our projects um, sustainable and um, with minimal impact to the environment. And then I think one of the biggest thrusts of our work has been um, working with the communities that we are working in to help economic uh, and community impact, have a positive impact in the community. And many of our projects that you'll see when I go into this are public-private partnerships. And so we're working with the local jurisdictions, with community groups and trying to have positive impact in those communities. Um, you know, as I said, I, we started with just two people. We had a little office in uh, Fifth Street Market and. That was uh, just about 10 years ago. Uh, five years ago, we really started to grow. And we we pivoted from representing other people on their projects to, to pursuing our own projects. And when we did that, we actually kind of looked at our structure and re recognized that we had built a team of very good project managers who were good at representing other owners. Um, but we were actually heading in a different direction with a company that had a little bit different risk profile. And... Um, didn't match up quite as well with the owner representation company that we had been in the past. And at that time, we split our company into two. We formed a company called Redpoint. Uh, it's an owner's rep company. They um, help do construction management and owner representation on all of the projects that we do, as well as outside uh, firms. So currently, they're uh, running a project in Central Oregon for the Deschutes County Library. It's a $250 million bond project. They're the owner's rep. Um, and they really were able to focus on that type of work. And then we have the ability to hire them on all of our projects and it alleviates us from having to have the day-to-day -day oversight during construction. And so that's allowed us to be a lot more nimble. Uh, we're back down to seven or eight people in our company. Uh, they've grown to about 11 or 12 people and are doing work all throughout the Northwest doing owner representation. Uh, the other the other piece we realized as we started growing and doing more complicated projects and we were having to sponsor those projects is we needed to solve our capital stack uh, challenges. So we we fund all our own projects and pre-development that can be very expensive. Um, and we have to provide equity to those projects, uh, equity and debt to those projects. And so uh, strategically, we partnered uh, with a company called Edlin and Company. They were formerly known as Girding Edlin. Um, 
my business partner, Dean Pape, worked with them when they were doing the South Waterfront work in Portland. And um, they had done brewery blocks in Portland and were a very well hilled developer that was actually transitioning from uh, very large national projects uh, into a smaller boutique firm. And so we strategically made a joint venture with them to pursue projects. We had been able to source a lot of projects. They were able to help us with our capital needs on those projects. And so that was important in our evolution to, to forge those partnerships. Um, where that led to was, was something that kind of had evolved out of um, sort of Dean and my own personal experiences, but it's something we call our Inter Intermountain West investment strategy. Um, I don't think we called it that from the beginning. We we had uh, we had been looking at projects that we thought were interesting, and and we're looking at communities that we thought were interesting, and those tended to be secondary markets that were close to ski resorts that uh, weren't overcrowded, where cost of living was less. Um, it, it paralleled a little bit the moves we had made in our lives, uh, moving from San Francisco to Eugene. Dean had moved from Portland back to Eugene at the time. Uh, and so we started going out and actually just visiting these communities and looking for potential projects. Um, out of that, we developed really an investment thesis. And as we were sourcing these projects, um, we really honed in on what we were looking for in these projects. And um, this was useful for us as we were able to communicate to our investors why we thought these were good projects. Um, and so that, that really sort of was the seed of the Intermountain West strategy. So as I said, they were they're typically secondary markets. We currently are doing work here in Eugene, in Bend. Uh, we have quite a few projects in Boise. Uh, we have projects in Spokane and up in Coeur d'Alene. And I'll, I'll go through some of those projects. Uh, they all tended to be near the outdoors. So um, one of our criteria, there was a couple of criteria. One, could I get there, visit that community on Alaska Airlines and be back in the same day? You know, I, I didn't want to be constantly on the road. So can I fly to Spokane, go see a project site and still be home on Alaska Air in the same day? So all those communities there, it's a long day, I'll admit, but I, I can get home on, on the same day on those uh, working in those communities. So that narrowed us down to the Intermountain West. Um, as I said, they all had a ski resort like within an hour. So I knew that there was an outdoor lifestyle component to these communities. Um, they, they all have, just about all of them have a university. They're anchored with higher education in some way. And in some cases, a community like Spokane actually has five uh, universities all located within the universe, university district of Spokane. Um, people were, we, we were noticing people moving there for quality of life reasons. They were coming out of places, maybe it was Southern California or Portland or Seattle, Bay Area, um, because life had become challenging, difficult, expensive, traffic was a problem, and they were looking to move to these communities to raise their families and have a better quality of life, spend less time in the car, have better access to the outdoors. And as we developed this thesis, one of the things we noticed is that um, costs were increasing in these communities. And, you, and I'm sure everybody's heard this narrative that as places become more and more popular, the people who are actually uh, support those communities or were no longer able to live in those communities. So we've coupled this investment thesis with um, a workforce housing component where in all of the communities we're in, we're striving to find ways to deliver um, workforce housing, which delivers housing to anywhere between 80 and 120% uh, AMI um, households. So there's some common themes on these projects. They tend to be um, public-private partnerships, not exclusively, but a lot of them are. We're able to um, really partner with local jurisdictions, in particular with workforce housing, uh, employ some of the tools that the local jurisdictions have, to make those projects feasible uh, to deliver lower income uh, housing. Uh, we focus a lot on locations. Uh, we tend to be either in the urban core, adjacent to the urban core, adjacent to the university or at the nexus between those two locations. Uh, and you'll see in some of our projects, we sit right in between both the downtown core and the university. And we feel that's important for sort of how we position our projects and who our, uh, who our customers and our tenants are. Uh, all of our projects have a, com have a community involvement component. Um, 
you know, oftentimes with public private partnerships, that's part of what our, our agreement is, is, is giving back to the community. But we like to engage and really understand communities. We spend a lot of time in the communities we do work, work in. We try and make connections with uh, community organizations. And to the degree that we can, we involve them in our projects. And then again, sustainability and low impact design. That is sort of a theme through all of our work. Uh, we're typically either getting a certification, um, whether it be a LEED certification or Earth Advantage, uh, and then leveraging that to really benefit the, the project and the economics of the project. So I'll start with, I think, one of the first projects that I really was involved in, which was um, a project we did in, in Bend, Oregon, called the Hickson. It's on the west side of Bend um, at the corner of uh, Century Drive and Simpson. So, it was a fairly desirable location. Um, it, it checked a lot of the, the boxes of our thesis, although when we started this one, we hadn't really fully developed the uh, the thesis. Um, but it it really was our first project where we sort of leaned into this idea of a lifestyle market. And um, we had been seeing people migrate to Bend. Really, this was prior to COVID, um, just to get to have that outdoor lifestyle. And um, again, it's near a university. This project is, is, is uniquely positioned directly between uh, sort of the downtown and the Cascades, uh, OSU Cascades campus, and in, in a really a desirable area uh, of Bend. It was a former Ray's shopping uh, grocery store. I don't know if any of you remember the old Ray's that had actually had the roof cave in on the Snowmageddon they had there. And so we were looking at a at a property that had a you know really a distressed asset, um, looking for ways that we could leverage that into um, really a, a much better project. And so that was kind of the genesis for for this first project. Um, we ended up developing this and delivering this project. And, and this project is 206 units of uh, apartments, market rate apartments with uh, about 20,000 square feet of ground floor retail. Um, we uh, developed this project and, and came to market right in the midst of COVID and um, kind of a little bit of a panic for us. We, did, we had no idea what COVID would mean for, for anything, the economy, for renting, for uh, what might happen to Bend. And it really, it was interesting to see what happened. We actually, um, had a huge amount of interest in this project. What we saw were people who were who were stuck in larger metro areas on lockdown, unable to get outside, all of a sudden working remotely. You know, everybody had gone to working remote and they were questioning, why would I live in, in uh, San Francisco and not be able to go anywhere and do anything? Um, they were all expressing interest in coming to bands where they could get outside, ride a bike. Um, and so we had, I think three months before we opened our door, this was the first summer of COVID, we had a waiting list of over 300 people who were interested in this project. Um, and about 40% of those people were coming from markets outside of Bend, major metropolitan markets, and their employers were people like Google and Microsoft and uh, people who had, had strong incomes. And, and this project leased up, we were 100% leased on 206 units within 10 days of opening our door. And that's when we realized, hey, maybe we're really onto something here. This, this was kind of our proof of concept. Um, it was exacerbated by COVID. And, and we had, at this time, we had lined up a handful of projects through uh, the public-private uh, process. Uh, hadn't developed them yet, but we had them in our queue. And so that's when we really leaned in and, and sort of uh, moved, moved forward on our Intermountain West strategy. Um, during this time, my business partner, Dean, had moved to, to Boise, and um, he was really seeing a lot of the same things happening in Boise. We, we were getting people, in fact, as we were looking to hire and, and, and grow our company, um, we were having a hard time finding people locally, but we were getting, if we advertised that you could either work from Eugene or Bend or Boise, we were getting a lot of people coming to us from Southern California or Seattle or Portland looking to make that migration and, and looking to do work with us. Um, and so he, he set up an office in, in Boise and uh, we grew our company there and started doing work um, in old uh, area called Old Boise, just to the outside of downtown. Uh, we had formed a really a pretty 
important partnership uh, with a property owner there who kind of was like the diamond parking of Eugene. This family owned all the vacant parking lots adjacent to Old Boise, right next to downtown, close to Boise State. So again, it's checking a handful of those boxes that we had identified on our um, sort of target. And um, this was the first project really to launch. This was uh, an 85 unit multifamily project with uh, some ground floor retail. And we had partnered with um, the redevelopment agency of Boise on this project to provide a pocket park. They actually were looking for some open space. And you can see in the front here, this is uh, actually a public park. Um, we, we got some funding from uh, the redevelopment agency and then partnered with the Shakespeare uh, Festival that happens in Boise and they do small little pocket performances here. So again, it was taking that sort of community aspect to give back um, and, and really sort of leveraging that into sort of a unique project. Um, as we were working on that, um, we had an opportunity through um, another competitive RFP process uh, with, with the redevelopment agency to acquire a property right next to the river, uh, close to downtown. And um, this project, Ashen River, uh, really was our, part of our proposal was um, we, we were seeing the need for, for developing workforce housing close to downtown. And our proposal said that if, if the real redevelopment agency was willing to write down the land, we would provide rent restricted units for a period of 10 years at 100% AMI. And that was substantially below what we were seeing in the market. Um, and, and these were larger units. They tended to be two and three bedroom units that could accommodate families. Uh, we won the RFP. We were able to get the economics of that to work. Um, and so that was really our first foray into sort of solving that workforce housing issue. Um, we actually ended up hiring uh, somebody recently from Chicago, moving to Boise with a young family, um, stay at home husband with their with their new baby. And uh, we were able to get them into, into this building and they would not have been able to live close to downtown without having housing um, uh, that was subsidized for workforce housing. So that was another sort of proof of concept on our, on our workforce housing project. Um, since then in Boise, and this, I'm going to kind of go through each market and talk about our evolution of, of our work in those markets. Um, we won another public-private partnership with uh, the redevelopment agency uh, in Boise and the Boise YMCA. Uh, there was a four, four block um, area of downtown that was assembled by both the YMCA and um, the redevelopment agency. And so this, this was a project that we, we competed for based upon delivering um, workforce housing, market rate housing, uh, independent and assistant living. And we had partnered with Providence Health to provide actually healthcare component to this project. In addition to building a brand new Y that would provide services to all these uh, different people that were living in downtown. Um, and this really took sort of this evolution of, of workforce housing, market rate housing, and, and elevated it to a, uh, really a whole community um, within a four block area. Um, we focused on healthy living, having health care, family services, fitness, um, all, all within one uh, sort of mixed community within right near the core of downtown. Uh, right now, we're still in in uh, sort of early pre-development stages with this project with goals of breaking ground in this project in about a year. This will deliver a 70,000 square foot new YMCA <laughs> and uh, over 500 housing units uh, right next to the core of downtown uh, Boise. I'll, I'll move a little bit to um, our projects in Spokane. Spokane was a community that um, when we visited there and looked at it, um, we felt it was it was Boise five years before uh, when we had first started our work in Boise. We had seen a lot of the same things happening there. There was a, a revitalization in the downtown core. There was a very interesting historic building stock uh, in, in the downtown core of, of Spokane. It had this great legacy of the, the World's Fair there and this amazing river that runs through it. Uh, there's five universities all located within one district. 
uh, right next to the downtown, uh, had access to outdoor lifestyle. Um, and, and there were some other indicators. Like, I think one of the things that we would always do is like, if we could find a good whiskey bar that kind of was, was cool and hip, that was a sign that, you know, the downtown was, was evolving. So that was always, that was maybe more of a personal goal than it was a professional goal, but we would always go seek out the best, uh, the best whiskey bars in the communities that we were living in. Um, and there was a foodie scene happening there uh, and people were migrating there from Seattle, from San Francisco, we were seeing an in-migration. Um, we were able to secure a site that really was right in between both the uh, the downtown core and the university district uh, right on Riverside Avenue and really a key location uh, between those two major uh, sort of forces in Spokane. Uh, this is a 150 unit project. We partnered um, with the city of Spokane to do both public improvements on this project and to deliver um, rent restricted workforce housing units into this project as part of a 10 year property tax exemption that we received in return. Um, in addition to that, we really reached out and focused on engaging with the community. Um, this project will have a, a large mural painted on the side of the building from uh, a local arts group that sponsors uh, BIPOC communities looking at uh, sort of their history and, and uh, interesting connections to, to Spokane's history. And you'll see in that picture in the lower right hand corner is uh, the woman we partnered with who's now painting that mural on the side of the building. Um, so as much as possible, we're trying to engage communities and, and work with local organizations to provide a richness and uniqueness to our projects. Um, I'll, I'll jump to Eugene. I have I have maybe three projects I'll talk quickly about in Eugene, and then um, maybe we can open it up for for some questions. We can focus on some some areas that are of interest to folks. Uh, this is a project here that I've partnered with on the Chambers family um, called Crosswood. It's you can see by the photo where it's located. It's right near Matt Knight Arena, uh, adjacent to the university, and. Um, this is a project that was actually not a student housing project. It was a, uh, it really was focused on university, but not on on student housing. Uh, it was the goal here was to provide housing for faculty, staff, and and people who worked uh, within the district there. Um, specifically, we were partnering with and reaching out to Knight Science Campus to see if uh, there was some possibilities that we could partner with them to provide housing. Um, this will really be the first non-student housing project uh, created within the in that sort of university core, and um, just coming to market now. I think if you drive by, you'll see that on on Franklin that we're up out of the ground and should be delivering units towards the end of the year. Um, on the sustainability front, this was a project where the Chambers family really wanted to push innovation, looking at new construction types, and. Um, some of you may be familiar with cross laminated timber. That's something that's been very important to the Northwest. Uh, it's a new construction type where you take small pieces of wood to build up uh, much larger uh, structural uh, panels that on this project we use specifically for the floor system. So instead of laying out a handful of small joists, we are taking these large slabs of uh, cross laminated timber and creating a floor system. And that did a couple things for us. One, it it, um, it accelerated our schedule. It's a lot easier to lay these large planks than it is to lay a, a lot of small joists. And it also allowed us to um, expose all our ceilings. So you'll see in that lower right-hand corner, all of these units will have all wood ceilings throughout the units. Um, and so that was a pretty unique aspect of, of this project. Uh, flock 13. Um, this was a this was sort of an interesting opportunity that we we have been working on. That's a direct partnership with the University of Oregon Bookstore. Um, when Dean and I started our work uh, early on, we actually were involved in quite a few student housing projects, and we had worked on uh, the two big projects that were on the east side of campus, over by Matt Knight Arena, um, Skybox, and Courtside. And we had an opportunity to work on a project on Kincaid and 14th called K14. 
on that project, I actually represented the um, Central Presbyterian Church on their piece of property. It used to be the Koinia Center there. And I worked with them to structure a, a land lease arrangement that allowed them to retain ownership of the property and uh, the develop, developer on that project to build student housing. Um, about three years ago, the UBO bookstore was looking at sort of what are they going to do with the properties that they had acquired around their bookstore. In fact, they were wondering what to even do with their bookstore. They no longer were um, selling books to students. Books had gone 100% online, and they were pivoting to a really a merchandising, duck-branded merchandising store. Um, they're a 100-year-old mission-driven nonprofit affiliated with the University of Oregon. And their mission is to serve students and faculty of the University of Oregon. So they were trying to determine what their future looked like, what was their next 100 years. And they were reaching out to uh, potential partners to help them realize that vision. We came to them and I pitched them the idea of the land lease. Um, you know, I, I recognized that they were a long-term institution, that their assets were important to them. Um, and, and the goal of this was to allow them to retain some ownership uh, to hold on to the land and allow us to partner with them to develop and re-envision what um, the U of O Duck Store could, could mean for 13th Avenue. <coughs> but as part of that, we're making improvements both to the Duck Store, and then you can see in that image there, we're, we're bringing um, 188 beds to, to campus, student housing, um, and reinvigorating 13th Avenue. And that's really one of the real goals here is to maintain that 13th Avenue corridor as a center of student life and having the U of O duck store really be part of that. Um, so that project right now is scheduled to start a demo on um, the, some of the storefronts adjacent to the duck store this December. And then we'll be uh, developing that project over 2023, delivering in fall of 2024 to students. And I guess I'll, I'll end with the steam plant. This, this one doesn't necessarily tie in uh, entirely to our sort of Intermountain West strategy. It's, it's a pretty unique project. We have a handful of new, unique projects that we'll take on, uh, but it does tie a lot into sort of um, a lot of the other boxes we're looking to check. It's a public-private partnership with uh, the city of Eugene. Um, there's a lot of aspects of this project that are striving to give back to the community. We're looking at historic preservation. Um, you'll see in that image there, we're taking some of the artifacts in the building and putting them out into the landscape, uh, re-engaging with the river. Um, this building is within you know, 30 feet of the river. You can never build a building that close again. So it's a unique opportunity for us to really create a public ground floor that can engage with the river uh, and create opportunities along that bike path. Um, and in addition to that, in the lower right on that, you'll see there's a performance space that's planned for the inside that again plays off the artifacts inside uh, inside the building. Our plan is to put in a, an 88 room uh, boutique hotel, uh, ground floor restaurant, and additionally some creative office space uh, where that ground floor restaurant really can act as the uh, sort of concierge to, to all of those uh, different uses within the building. This is a project I'm partnered on with Mark Fronmeyer, Arkimoto. So in addition, it'll have a mobility hub. He's looking at having a place there where uh, people can rent his Arkimoto vehicles when they're in town. Maybe they're going to take an Uber from the airport. They'll land at the hotel. They could hop in, uh, hop in Arkimoto and head over to campus. Um, and so really trying to maximize a lot of different, um, different uses into, into one building that can really become a great uh, engaging public space. Um, still negotiating with the city on this project. Um, there is a little bit of a gap. We're trying to identify some sources to fill the gap. Uh, we will be going back to city council in November and, and hopefully be able to find a, a path forward on this project. If we are able to do that, our goal will be to start uh, full design of the project beginning of next year and by the end of 2023 be in the ground with construction on this project. So that that's um that's really what I have planned for talking about. I've got more projects. I would love to hear if there's questions. Um, and I'll I'll turn it over to Rick. 
Mark, thank you very much. Uh, fascinating portfolio and an incredible, uh, incredible success for you and your partner, Dean. Uh, very admirable. I'll start with one initial question and then we'll open it up to uh, everyone else who's participating. So you talked about attracting talent to various communities through your mission of um, innovative mixed use development. Um, and but along with the talent attracting businesses, particularly in a mixed use, you know, office, residential, commercial, residential. So what specifically could you share with us, you know, what are communities doing? Uh, how are they? positioning themselves, how are they evolving in order to successfully attract projects such as yours, attracting talent, attracting businesses? What are communities doing? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, so much of our work is public-private partnerships. And we do rely on that, um, the local jurisdictions to help us achieve goals beyond what just the market can bear on their own. So, um, most of our projects have have some component of either a land write down, um, some other form of contribution to the project that allows us to ch achieve um, an outcome, for instance, like reduced rents, if if that would be the goal of the project. Um, Boise is pretty unique. They have um, CCDC, which is their redevelopment agency, is very focused on strategic investment in projects. Um, they recognize housing was a huge need. And so what they'll do is they will actually work on securing sites, put, putting out those properties into an RFP and, and looking to sort of leverage some public benefit uh, back to the community on those projects. Um, and I would say that's the case in almost all, all the communities that we work in is that there is some sort of public investment that's allowing us to achieve housing. Um, and so I think that that's been pretty key. You know, I'll, Bend is, is a little bit unique in that, um, you know, Bend is attracting people without a whole lot of public public investment. I think they're actually struggling a little bit now because the, the community has grown so fast. Um, in that case, we really, the market has driven a lot of our work there. We, we haven't done a whole lot of public-private partnerships uh, within Bend. And that's been based just upon, you know, the popularity. Of the <laughs> but in, uh, in Eugene, um, a project I didn't talk about, 1059 Willamette, that's a partnership with uh, the city of Eugene, um, where we'll commit to half the units being 80% uh, area median income and the other half being market rate. And uh, that's the old LCC building on campus across from the bus station. And uh, they'll write down the land, um, provide us the land uh, at no cost. And then in addition, they're waiving uh, SDC fees and permit fees in order for us to achieve um, the goal of providing workforce housing into the downtown core. So, so I, I don't know that there's one solution. Um, you know, we're working with Glenwood now, or looking at Glenwood now, I think there's um, a huge infrastructure need in order to execute on projects there. So we're working closely with City of Springfield on how can we um, leverage the urban renewal district there to, to expand that, that infrastructure and create um, the opportunity for us to to develop projects in, in the riverfront. Um, so a variety, variety of different tools out there that we that we uh, that we use with local jurisdictions. Um, and, and probably not one solution. It's a look, it's it's usually looking at a variety of different solutions and in, in how you might solve a problem. Thank you, Mark. Anybody have a question for Mark? Yes. Hi, Mark. Um, Tiffany Edwards. I don't know if you can see me, but uh, I, I, have a I have a question about the, obviously you all do a lot of work in various different communities. I'm curious if you have any insight about how our region, Eugene Springfield, compares with trying to get things done in a Boise or a Bend or, you know, what kind of dynamics did you share that really kind of create some differences there? Yeah. Um, great question, Tiffany. Um, you know, I mentioned Ben. Ben does actually, they're trying to solve the housing, the housing problem. So I'll get, for instance, Ben does not have a lot of tools and they're trying to solve that issue now. What's happening in Bend has been, um, there's been such an influx 
of uh, people migrating to Bend who may work remotely, may have strong incomes, may not need you know, a job to support themselves there. They're there moving for the lifestyle. And what that's done is really push housing costs uh, super high. And um, Bend has been behind on programs that may help facilitate uh, sort of that middle housing. Um, so there are some affordable housing projects in Bend. There are a lot of market rate housing projects happening in Bend. But that's a community that has very few tools to support uh, workforce housing. And that is probably one of the biggest issues that we're seeing within Bend is that people can't afford to live there anymore. Um, so that's an example of a community that's that's been a little bit behind on providing tools to, to support um, you know, the workforce in the community. Boise, on the other hand, has been very proactive. They've, they have a redevelopment agency that's fully engaged uh, doing things like acquiring properties um, to facilitate projects around housing. Um, I think almost every project that we've worked on in, in Boise has had some component of public investment through the redevelopment agency. Um, they're well-funded, they are mission-driven, they, they really have some clear objectives that they're trying to reach, and, uh, and then they've been given the tools, uh, whether that be through urban renewal, being able to borrow against future property taxes. Um, so they're a very well-funded agency that, that has clear goals, clear objectives, and they've been able to fulfill those objectives. Um, you know, I think Spokane has been similar. Uh, they, again, use urban renewal. And I, and I think that's probably one of the most common tools is, is urban renewal. Um, and they they have clear objectives around what their goals are for housing and how they're going to get there, um, and so that that's been a, a very productive partnership uh, to be able to leverage that urban renewal fund into into a success on projects. Uh, Springfield has urban renewal. We're looking at it in Glenwood, and I think that's probably one of the most meaningful tools that we'll be able to utilize to be able to see that project come to life. Um, you know, you can see what's happened on the Eugene Riverfront with with uh, urban renewal and, and allowing the Eugene Riverfront to, to build infrastructure with urban renewal and, and start to see some projects get out of the ground. So, um, you know, I think those are the, the two things. One is you have economic tools that can help reach community objectives and then be clear about what those are. And then, um, you know, be willing to sort of implement those um, tools. That's what we've seen our success in the public-private partnership work. Great, thank you. Thank you, Tiffany. Who else? Anybody else? I'll jump in again, Mark. Uh, Rick here. So, um, as you mentioned, Springfield has two urban renewal districts, if I'm not mistaken, downtown and Glenwood. Um, they, they've been active in downtown Springfield in the past, leveraging some some Main Street investment. Um, they're currently rather active in one Glenwood Riverfront. Um, what more, what do you see? What have you seen in Springfield that's working in that regard? And what do you believe the community, we'll say the city of Springfield, uh, could do more of? Yeah, well, I think. I mean, we've seen that, I mean, downtown Springfield's amazing now. And I think that's largely due to the efforts that the city has put into to the work on Main Street. Um, a lot of that's been, from my understanding, through urban renewal. I think that's a huge success story. Um, so, you know, I think that, that's that been proof, proof in case right there that uh, you've got a tool there that can create very successful economic development and reinforce communities. Um, you know, there are some other things that we're looking at now. Um, you know, we're facing some challenges with uh, the inflationary environment we're in. Um, so so I'll, I guess I'll talk a little bit about some of our challenges and how that might be able to be solved with, with, um, with government input or community, community um, programs. But, you know, we still have raised, rising construction costs. Our construction costs haven't really tapered off a whole lot. We're hoping we'll see some tapering of construction costs. And now we're in this inflationary environment where we have uh, much higher interest rates. We were locking in interest rates at three and a half percent. And now we're, I, I don't even know, 
will be at 6%, 7% before too long. So that's squeezing us on, on both ends, both on the cost side and then on um, sort of, you know, what our limitations are with how much debt we can get. One of the things that we're looking at, for instance, on the steam plant that we're going to be investigating is whether we can do uh, a low interest uh, loan backed by uh, by the city to help us get over some of those debt hurdles. Is there a way that they can step in and help become a part of that capital stack? Um, and that that's a tool they can use. They could use that through urban renewal, perhaps as a funding source, knowing that that's going to be coming back to them. You know, maybe it's a 10 year term on the loan. Um, that is is probably likely the the best tool that we could use today to help us overcome some of the challenges we're seeing in in placing debt on our projects. Um, so, how many different layers can you put in the capital stack? You know, the steam plant, for instance, has historic preservation uh, tax credits that'll come in. That's that's part of our capital stack. Uh, we would be looking at we're looking at pace financing, which which um, is guaranteed against your property taxes and looks at uh, energy efficiency measures that you're putting in the building to provide some debt to the project. Low interest loan from, from the city. Uh, we'll have conventional debt on the project and then we'll have our, our typical equity partners. So if there's some different ways that, um, you know, jurisdictions can come into a project, you know, debt debt is a, Having another source of debt on a project that maybe is at a lower interest rate is is a great tool, and that's something that we're looking at right now. Very good, thank you, Mark. It's quite an audience today. It must be Friday. Um, you better online. Oh, yes, Sandy. Uh, Sandy Belson with the City of Springfield. Uh, my question to you would be in terms of the housing demand and amenities or the units themselves, what you see as maybe different in either workforce or market rate or in different, these sort of secondary markets from other markets. Yeah, great question. Um, yeah, so, um, you know, amenities or sort of what we're delivering on our product type is something we do focus a lot of time on. And um, we actually don't really treat workforce housing any different than market rate housing. I, we feel the residents have pretty much this very similar needs and very similar, you know, housing uh, objectives. And so we don't really necessarily differentiate on, on that standpoint. But, um, you know, the uh, amenities have evolved and have changed, and they definitely are um geared towards the specific markets we're in so it's pretty important that we understand really what are the needs of the residents that we're going to be attracting to our projects in those specific markets and uh for instance in bend uh one thing we're doing we have we have several projects on the books now over there uh we're looking at more opportunities from work from home pods for instance so we'll have a, a ground floor amenity space that may be a lounge area um that will be, you know, fully wired and have workspaces to allow people to do uh, potentially work from home. And then we couple that with actually some private rooms where if they want to get out of their apartment and go into a space and uh, do a Zoom call or, or work from a work from home pod, they've got that as a, as a amenity to them. Um, we, we try and couple our social spaces together. So, you know, even things like, and this may seem sort of simple, but We'll take up uh, the bike storage room or a gear storage room and in, in Bend in particular, you know, everybody's got their their gear and their bikes and we'll put that next to uh, some of the social spaces and within those spaces we'll put a, a bike repair room or a, sort of a lounge so people can gather before they go out on a ride or, um, you know, go, go skiing and really try and create those social spaces and aggregate them together so that you are creating communities, places where people will see each other. Um, and, and have a place outside of their units where they can uh, socialize and spend time together. One of the other things that we've really focused on, um, and we're doing this on the, the Duck Store project on 13th Avenue, is uh, we try, like to integrate where we have an active ground floor and where there's retail uses on the ground floor. We like to um, integrate as much as possible um, the, the residential components of the building within maybe a retail space in the ground floor. Uh, we had studied a lot of sort of 
larger projects up in Portland and, and looked at sort of their lobbies and they tend to be sort of these furniture showrooms where people really aren't spending a lot of time in them. Maybe it's a place you walk through. Um, on the on the duck store project, we'll actually be having a cap, uh, coffee bar that'll be part of our, it's not even just a coffee bar, it'll be a full you know coffee shop that'll be part of our leasing area so that residents can come down and actually meet people outside of the building, you know, mingle with the general community. Um, in a place that doesn't feel like a sort of a sterile lobby. It'll be much more energized and interesting. And then we view that as an opportunity for people that are coming and visiting that, that coffee shop to maybe be interested in, in what that project has to offer and potentially become a future resident. So those are, those are, there's a lot of, you know, it depends on the specific project. We're doing a, potentially a climbing gym in one of the amenity spaces in Bend. Um, in Spokane, we have a lot of large community spaces that, uh, again, focus on, on working from home and have study areas near the university. Um, and so those are those are some of the things we try and respond to what's what we're seeing in the markets uh, that we're working. On. Mark, we have one online question. Um, in your view, what kind of project or investment is the keystone catalyst for development in Glenwood? Costs and challenges aside. Yeah, great, great question. I, I think um, there, there's so many sort of rich opportunities that surround that Glenwood site. The river is amazing there. Uh, you can walk across the bridge and be near downtown. Um, we we just got that huge public investment in the in the road system there. Uh, it looks like we'll have. You know, with adjacent property, there's almost 30 acres assembled that could, you know, really be a launching pad for an amazing community in Glenwood. The biggest challenges I think we have there is is going to be extending infrastructure. How do we get that infrastructure extended? Um, you know, what what is the right mix of public infrastructure there, whether it be parks or roads or open space, uh, making sure that we're balancing that. A lot of that has been set up in the framework plan, and there's a good template for starting that. We're going to have to, you know, assess that, look at um, sort of what tools are available for us to implement that infrastructure, and that really will be the the kickstart for those projects is getting getting infrastructure extended to allow the the private development to occur there. How are we doing for time? One more question. Anyone? Uh, less of a question. Hey, Neil Ladati from the city of Springfield. Hey, Mark. Um, I just wanted to say um, thanks to you for this presentation and also um, just to the audience. I mean, it's an incredible insight into how Mark and Jill have worked with the city. They're incredibly thoughtful and uh, they have a long history and they're incredibly smart. So we, when we're in these meetings, um, which we meet regularly, um, this is kind of the mark you get, whether it's a super challenging problem or something very easy. It's a very thoughtful uh, way for Springfield to move forward. And I know he put his um, kind of his core uh, elements at the beginning. Uh, that's just how we've found all of the meetings and interactions with Mark and Jill Sherman. So I think we're just in the best possible spot for Glenlake to move forward. So I um, just want to say thanks, Mark. I'm glad that folks got to this. Thank you, Neil. All right, well, we are at the one o'clock hour, so I will wrap us up today. Mark, thank you so much for presenting um, to our chamber members today. And Neil said it best, um, very, very thoughtful um, in your projects and your thought process for how these really integrate with the community and the needs for the community. So it's great to have a chance to hear from you today. Rick, thank you so much for moderating today's uh, presentation. Um, and thank you all for joining us. I do want to flag just a couple of upcoming programs that we hope to see you guys at. Um, in October, we'll have our joint reader breakfast. If you're looking to network with some uh, business owners who are up early in the morning at 7 a.m., it's going to be October 13th. Costumes are optional. Uh, we have a open house on the 21st. Um, or sorry, we have a small business solution sub on the 21st of October and an open house on the 25th of October. Uh, and then I definitely want to invite you guys to attend our uh, 2022 Leadership Summit that's coming up on November 10th. It's going to be a great full day program. 
uh, over at the Valley River and uh, focused on both civic leadership and professional organizational leadership development for you or your team members. Um, there is a save the date that went out in your newsletters, but more information is going to be coming over the next month. So I hope to see you guys there. Um, have a great day and thank you all for coming. Um, this program will be in your inbox sometime in the next week. Uh, we'll get the recording out to you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> 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 <laughs>